to the motherfucking relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Okay, we'll start with this. We now know who it is, Stephanie Hahn, unbeaten up and comer Stephanie Hahn, the younger sister of former IBF champion Jennifer Hahn. We now know who she's going to be facing very soon. She's going to be facing Miranda Reyes. You may be familiar with that name. That's the same Miranda Reyes from right here in the US of A that faced Carolyn Dubois earlier this year, dropped a decision. She's coming right off of that loss and she's gonna be attempting to rebound against Stephanie, who is unbeaten at this time. Stephanie sports a professional record of eight wins with no losses, no draws. Two knockouts. To Miranda, who sports a professional record of seven wins with two losses, one draw, three knockouts. Ten years younger than Stephanie Hahn. Stephanie's 33, whereas Miranda's 23. Stephanie will have home field advantage as this fight is set to go down in her native El Paso. The Hans are quite well known there, the fighting Hans. Jennifer, Stephanie, the whole family. Yeah. Thoughts on this fight? It's an interesting situation. I think this could be a potential banana skin for what is the still unbeaten Stephanie Hahn. Don't let Miranda Reyes' record fool you. She's fought better and more experienced fighters so far than Stephanie has. They've got close to the same number of fights, but looking at Miranda's record, I feel like she's been matched tougher than Stephanie has. Perhaps that's why Miranda's got two losses and one draw. I mean, how do you think Stephanie Hahn would have fared against Carolyn Dubois if she fought Carolyn in her last fight the way that Miranda fought Carolyn in her last fight? Stephanie would have lost too. I think so. What I notice about Miranda Reyes's opponents and Stephanie's is that these girls that Miranda's been fighting, you know, they've got more experience or they're just better fighters, very good fighters, whereas Stephanie, not that there's anything wrong with her quality of competition so far, it's just not as ambitious, I'll say, as what you've seen from Miranda, who is several years younger. That matters too. And Miranda has fought in a 10-rounder before, at least once in her last fight. She's been 10 rounds with Carolyn Dubois, whereas Stephanie to date, she's never fought in a 10-rounder before. The most she's ever fought for was eight rounds. I think that matters, that matters too. That young Mirandia was able to go the distance with a very strong fighter, a hard puncher, a southpaw, and Carolyn Dubois, where a lesser fighter might have got themselves knocked out. Miranda didn't. She hung in there. And that's valuable experience, believe it or not. How so? Well, if you can take what Carolyn Dubois has got, Carolyn, who punches really fucking hard, by the way, and throws a lot of punches, if you can take what Carolyn's got for 10 rounds, then I think you can take what Stephanie's got. For 10 rounds. That's what I think. Young Mirandia is best described as a mid-range to inside fighter. Her skill set is in keeping with someone who fights at that proximity. Bobbing and weaving, catching and shooting, short hooks, mid-range to inside. What stands out? The intensity at which she fights. That stands out to me. Sharp movements. She's a sharp puncher. Tough. Strong. She's kind of hot too. She has youthfulness on her side and some speed. Thinking about that and thinking about Stephanie, who's 33 years old, I feel like Miranda keeps shape better in the fight and in the exchange better than Stephanie does. That Stephanie sometimes looks disorganized when she's trying to land the power shot. They're both scrappers. Both Stephanie and Miranda. They're both aggressive fighters. But I like how Miranda keeps shape in the exchange a bit better than Stephanie. She looks more coordinated, more fluid to me. Me! The way she bobs and weaves under sweeping hooks, rolls and rides punches, I, I just feel like she's a little bit more developed than Stephanie, even though she's 10 years younger than Stephanie. This is for a WBA Intercontinental title. At 135 pounds, a lesser version of the full title that Katie Taylor still holds oh. at this weight. So one would assume whoever wins the fight comes one step closer to fighting for the full title. Right. First look, this may be a difficult fight for Stephanie Hahn, perhaps the most difficult fight of her career, because I mean, you're not gonna knock her out. If Carolyn didn't knock out Miranda Reyes, I don't think Stephanie's gonna knock out Miranda Reyes. She might be all over you. This is a litmus test. Set to go down July 27th in El Paso at the Coliseum. We'll talk more about the fight as the fight date approaches. You're young enough, you could come back from it. I just don't know that Spence was young enough to take that kind of beating at this point. You know, that that's where the, you have the question mark. I think if Spence was, you know, 25 years old, for argument's sake, you know, you can, that hungry determination can bring you back. Uh, but 33, you know, you... And you're made, rich. You, you've made a lot of money already, too. And you're but, rich. 
it, that it's a bit tougher, I think, to come back from that. If I can interject, I don't think Errol Spence's road back to the winner's bracket is difficult because he's coming off a loss no. or because he's 33 no. or because he made money. You know, Anthony Joshua's lost fights and he came back and he's 33. He makes more money than Spence, yeah. but a lot more money than Spence. Him and Canelo are the number one and number two top earning boxers in the sport, but Anthony still has the flame. Anthony still has the fire, the desire, in the belly to keep going and keep fighting and keep winning. Canelo has it too. He lost that fight to Dimitri Bivol. That wasn't the end. He's won a string of fights since then. Several successful defenses of his undisputed crown. Undisputed, something that Errol Spence Jr. has never been. No, I don't think the nature of Spence's problem is that he's 33 or that he's coming off a loss or that he's made some money. Those two guys made way more money than him and they've still got it. He doesn't. Why? Why? It's because he was never as good as you guys said he was. I'm not trying to kick him when he's down. Don't! I'm just being honest. If you want my honest opinion as to why things really aren't looking good for Errol Spence Jr., it's because he's not, nor was he ever the caliber of fighter you guys made him out to be. So now you're sympathetic because you're the ones who propped him up. Feeling buyer's remorse. Go back. Back! Go back to before the car accident that all of a sudden is so fucking important. Go back to before that when he fought Sean Porter. He struggled greatly with Sean Porter, more than Keith Thurman did, a hell of a lot more than Kel Brook did. He got hit a lot in that fight. It was a red flag for me. If you're getting hit this much at 147, What's gonna happen when you fight Crawford? Or what's gonna happen if one day you move up and wait and you're fighting bigger guys? Way bigger guys than Sean. Because the guys at 154, they're bigger than him. They're bigger than you. It was a red flag for me. Go back even further to when he fought Mikey Garcia, a lightweight with no prior experience at welterweight who went straight from 135 up to 147. He fought Robert Easter, unified titles with him at lightweight, then moved straight up to welterweight to fight Spence. Spence hit that guy over 300 times. He couldn't drop him and he couldn't stop him. It was a red flag for me. You can't stop a blown up lightweight with no prior experience at welterweight. How the hell are you gonna do at 154 where the guys are bigger, bigger than you, stronger, stronger than you? How are you gonna do that maybe you've got a bit of size for a welterweight, but you won't be so big and so bad at junior middle. It was a red flag for me. You're thinking to yourself, what are you saying? What are you saying? What? That Errol was never any good? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is he was a good welterweight, a unified champion, but I never liked his chances if he moved up. I never liked his chances if he ever went up to 154. Now that's where he's going, but now he's coming off a demoralizing loss. Lost. A lopsided beating at the hands of Terence Crawford, who in my opinion, he was avoiding for years. And you all saw why yep. last July. It's all different now. You're coming off a lopsided beating where you were stopped. You don't have Derek James in your corner anymore. You're about to face the most awkward fighter that division has to offer. A 154 pounder that stands in at about six foot four. Who's a southpaw, like you're a southpaw. The night of the fight, Errol will not have fought in well over a year's time. His last fight was in July. This fight is set to take place sometime in October or November. You're a volume puncher that likes to barrel forward. He's a volume puncher that likes to barrel forward, though in his last fight, he showed a different layer to his game, a different skill. He managed to maintain distance and keep it. He still got lumped up here and there. Like you won't? If you try to come forward on this guy throwing punches and bunches like you used to, you're not gonna get lumped up on the way in? I don't trust Errol Spence Jr.'s punch resistance, but that didn't start recently. That didn't even start at the car accident. Those of you that have been with this channel for at least the last four or five years will have heard me say on repeat that I don't like the way Errol absorbs punches. I don't like his body language. Much less now. I mean, if the car accident didn't shave years off of his professional boxing career, then surely the beating that he suffered last July, the sustained beating, surely that did. It's the kind of beating that can change you. Crawford did to Errol Spence what Joe Calzaghe did to Jeff Lacey. It's one of those beatings to where maybe you're not the same fighter or even the same person anymore. 
after that. What Crawford did to Errol Spence Jr., I liken it to what Julio Cesar Chavez did to Meldrick Taylor. It's like that. And it's not because he's 33 years old. It's not because he's made some money. It's because he was never really as good as you guys said he was. Not if he loses one fight and he can't stay in character anymore. The good guys, the really good ones, they can. Doesn't look like he can. He said it himself. This may be the last time we see him. So what does that tell you? Some fighters, they lose a fight. They take it in stride, even when they're knocked out, even when they're violently beaten. Some can. And some can't. The media push is likely the reason Errol has garnered so much sympathy, because these are the people that propped him up. These are the people that told you he's better than some other fighter. No, maybe he's more popular than some other fighter, but as far as fighting and that ability, eh, eh. so of course you don't want to be too hard on the guy when you're the ones who put him on a pedestal. You were the ones who were propping him up. Now you're experiencing buyer's remorse, realizing that he wasn't the caliber of fighter that everybody thought he was. Well, I said that beforehand. And that's all I'm saying, all I've been saying. Yeah, he's a good fighter, of course he is. He was a unified champion, but he was overrated grossly overrated and it seems to me that whether people want to accept it or not he's on borrowed time he always was upstairs in men's middleweight news it's official yanni beck's next fight unified middleweight champion yanni beck alam will defend his wbo and ibf middleweight titles against 21 and 0 new zealander andre mikhailievic on july 13th in las vegas we've broached this subject before talked about this fight and talked about how the people at top rank need to pay to play. That all right, you want to get Yanni Beck back out there? You want to keep him busy? You do that. But at some point, you're going to have to pay to play to get him better opponents, to get him those other alphabet titles at this weight. According to newly crowned WBC middleweight champion Carlos Adames, who's set to return to action next month opposite the ring U.S. Olympian Terrell Gachet on the undercard of Davis versus Martin, according to Carlos, he was offered less than his training camp fees for a Yanni Beck Alan Connolly fight for a three belt unification match. Do you believe that? I'm not sure. I think it all depends on when the offer was made, as Carlos Adamez was only recently elevated to full WBC champion, likely as a result of Jermall Charlo's latest arrest. After that, it seems that the WBC had finally had enough. But as it pertains to what Carlos was or wasn't offered for a Yanni Beck Alam Kanalai fight, I do think it matters when the offer was made. Was it made before he was elevated to champion or afterwards? Because now that he's a champion, maybe they'll offer him more money. Let's not kid ourselves. Carlos is a capable fighter, exciting to watch, he is, but he's not popular, he's not a big ticket seller, and if all he had to his name, if all he brought to the table was a WBC interim title that was of no use to Yanni Beck, then maybe they did lowball him. I don't think they lowballed him by that much, that they offered him less than his training camp fees. I do feel like they're exaggerating a bit there. They might be. But as stated, if the offer was made before Carlos was elevated to full champion, they likely didn't offer him very much. They might offer him more now. If he beats Terrell Gachet, stays WBC middleweight champion, the fact of the matter is, Yanni Beck needs Carlos just as much as Carlos needs Yanni Beck. And Top Rank needs to act like it. You're invested in this fighter. You have to pay to play. And I know you've got the money. I know you've got it. You want to know how I know you've got it? Because you're not on the hook for Tyson Fury's purses anymore. You weren't on the hook for the last one, or the one before that, or the one before that. What? Tyson Fury didn't fight in his last fight on top rank or ESPN's dime. No, Turkey al Sheik paid Tyson Fury his last purse for the Usyk fight and for the Nganu fight before that. Before that, he fought in the UK against Derek Chisora. That fight happened on Frank Warren's dime, not yours. You're thinking to yourself, what the hell does Tyson Fury's purses and who pays for them have to do with Yanni Beck Alam Kanalai? Well, that's money you don't have to shell out. Tyson Fury, he's a seven, eight figure fighter. That's seven or eight figures. You ain't got to gamble. You ain't got to shell out because you ain't been the one paying that guy. So I know you've got a surplus of cash and you need to use it. And I see where the money's going. I see where they're using it. They recently resigned 
Elvis Rodriguez. They recently signed Gustavo Limos. I see you've got enough money that you're adding to your existing stable of fighters at around 140 pounds. Not even saying that's a bad idea, but you need to pour some money into the career of Yannibek Alamkanalai too. You get him Carlos Adames, and if you can't get him Carlos, get him Lara, this division's WBA champion. You need to pour some money into that situation because Yannibek by himself. You know, he's not a Puerto Rican fighter or a Mexican fighter to where he's gonna have that built-in fan base, that grassroots following here in America. This guy's from Kazakhstan, like Golovkin was from Kazakhstan, but he's no Golovkin. Now what made Golovkin popular is even though there was a time, a long time, when he couldn't get the big names, he kept active, he kept busy. Every other time you see this guy beating the hell out of somebody, even if it's not a big name, you could use that formula for Yanni Bek Alamkanalai. Get him the other two champions at this weight, ensure that he becomes this division's undisputed champion. So by the time the familiar faces at 154 move up to 160, they'll have to answer to him. It's an investment in the future. For what? could be a super fight. When you think about fighters like Tim Kazoo, fighters like Xander Zayas, these guys that one day may end up at 160, they're gonna need a big name opponent. They're gonna need a big fight. Yanni Beck could be that big fight if you lay the foundation now. I would give Yanni Beck very good odds to beat today's Arislandi Lara, who's in his early 40s. And it would make for a good fight, an interesting one against the familiar face. I would also give him very good odds against Carlos Adamez, who I think is a skilled and crafty boxer, strong puncher, and he can switch hit, but I don't think he takes the best punch. I think Yanni Beck can beat him. So he's gonna be fighting Michaela Vick in July, which leaves a lot of time to schedule something more interesting and something bigger for later on in the year, say the fall or winter months. Let him cap off this year with a unification match. And I understand that the only other two alphabet titles at this weight are on the PBC side of things, but the PBC may cease to exist. Yeah, there was a time where they're not gonna let their guys cross the street, not the ones that got belts, but those days are over. Those days are long since passed. They're in a weakened state. They're operating at a much, much reduced capacity. They don't have any money, no fight dates, and at some point, those fighters are gonna be at your mercy. So get those guys to come over to top rank so Yanni Beck can beat him up and take their belts. You gotta do it. Bring the excitement back to the middleweight division that has been dying on the vine for years now, badly needing a shot in the arm. Yanni Beck could be that shot in the arm depending on how you match him. It's like a Bond villain, this guy. Have you ever heard him talk? Fuck how he talks. Have you ever seen him fight? He's violent. He's a southpaw. Do your job.